Hi, hello. Welcome to Telugu Nara Radio weekly webinar on immigration. So we are doing last couple of months uh, on immigration system, USA immigration system to simplify the USA immigration information. We are trying to give more very detailed information on the topic and uh, any the specified scenarios, your cases. Uh, yeah, welcome today to the session. Welcome, Lucas. Welcome. I've been Kat. How are you? Thank you for having me. It's uh, great to be back for a weekly Wednesday show. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, you are too busy. End of the month, October month, only two two days is left. How is the situation from your side? Well, you know, we're approaching the finish line for our first batch of uh, uh, GC filings for the month of October. It's been a hectic month. Uh, we're ready, you know, to have a reprieve, hopefully. Uh, you know, with a little bit of the works to go back to a uh, normal, normal work schedule. But, um, you know, we're still just like everyone else. We're, we're pending the new uh, visa bulletin for November. And, you know, we're quite curious to see what the dates might uh, be set for the, the next month and what might follow with USCIS. Yes, it means uh, that is a very high event. Everyone eagerly waiting for the November visa bulletin. As of now, today is the 20, October 28th. Uh, till date, we don't we don't see any visa written for November. Most of the uh, the 2012 to uh, May 2011 after uh, H1 holders are eagerly waiting for the next bulletin. The USCSR Department of State will move forward. How many if if how many months will forward to the filing date or final action date? Do you why the November U visa bulletin got delayed? Do you have any information on that one? Yes. Uh, so right now, um, November visa bulletins delayed from being posted due to some internal disagreements in the Department of State. Um, it has nothing to do with the visa bulletin that's being published. There's just some other uh, ancillary issues that are going on that affect the publication itself. Um, based upon you know what we've seen and what we've heard, uh, we expect EB2 to probably advance a couple of months. Uh, EB3 will probably stay around the same general area, if not retrogress a little bit. Um, but, you know, what I've been trying to explain to a lot of people is, you know, we have two sets of dates uh, whenever we're looking at the visa bulletin. We have the final action date, which is what provides us the ability to file or have a visa available uh, for the final GC process. Uh, which right now for EB2 and EB3 in India, respectively, is 2009-2010. Uh, uh, now, we also have the filing date, which allows us to go ahead and file the adjustment of status application with USCIS. And those dates are the ones that uh, we saw the drastic movements with here this past month in the October bulletin. And, um, you know, even if those dates remain the same or, prog or might progress a little bit, uh, it's important to note that USCIS this month has probably received upwards of 20,000 applications as a conservative number. And, you know, USCIS is not going to hire more people to process these uh, applications. So what are we going to see? Well, we're going to see a large influx of applications being uh, submitted. You know, someone has to be in the mail room. Someone has to open the mail, make sure packages are complete. Uh, scan the items, register them, so on and so forth, uh, and issue receipt notices. So if you can imagine your workload increasing 10 or 15 fold, uh, you know, USCIS might come back and say, well, we're going to only honor the final action dates uh, for November, even though the November uh, visa bulletin might have different dates for the filing dates, USCIS very well could just come back and honor only the final action dates. And that would you know, leave a few people, I think, that were waiting in EB2 to see, you know, hey, my EB2 uh, is priority date is um, September, and right now it's in May. Is it, should I wait? Should I downgrade? What should I do? Uh, so a few people in that scenario might uh, have a difficult time over the next couple of months if USCIS decides to go ahead and uh, uh, use the final action date. Okay. Uh, Lucas, it means um, this month is October 31st. 
tomorrow 29 and uh, friday is the 30 the 31 is a saturday even even some delays on uh, packing the file and ship got shipped on a friday evening it reaches to on saturday to the uscs centers the uscs will accept those packets or what what is the scenario well the so just to rule of thumb uscis does not accept packages on the weekend so they're only accepting packages monday through friday um typically you know on the weekends what we do is i'll mail uh packages on thursday overnight to get there friday um and then anything else that i mail i mail on saturday so it all you know because friday and saturday both would arrive on monday so everything probably needs to be mailed tomorrow um you know the, there is a mail rule sometimes used uh, for certain applications as far as you know if, if it's stamped and accepted by a courier or the post office uscis would honor that uh, i wouldn't risk that because if it is rejected for for that reason um you know you can't really just turn around and easily refile it's it's kind of a headache so uh, anyone who's listening if they're still thinking about filing i would say your debt your last date to file is going to be tomorrow uh, for it to be arriving on friday and then hopefully all application is almost a uh, uh, final review and the packing up and trying to send by today or tomorrow hopefully so if any delays, we are not sure about the November visa bulletin. We'll open for final action, final uh, the filing date or final action date. We still wait for the visa bulletin. It means you. It means can we expect on Friday the visa bulletin? I'm hoping Friday. I actually expect it at the earliest to be published on Friday. Um, and that, that's just going back to what we first opened the show with. I think that uh, there's some issues going on about some um, uh, <laughs> some uh, disagreements maybe with policy or, or procedures that are going on with Department of State. So that's affected the visa bulletin. And, uh, you know, at the earliest, I think it'll be uh, this Friday afternoon. OK, so Lucas, I think uh, last week we discussed about the H1 new wages. Uh, you said is a uh, couple of agencies or lawsuits are filing case on new wages the way we are about the injection well the court cases are still uh, in the process of uh, you know proceeding towards an injunction um, and you know hopefully into this week or next week we should have some answers or solutions to that there's i think three major cases filed one uh, by uh, IT serve alliance one by Aila whom I'm a member of American Immigration Lawyers Association, and I believe there's one or two others filed by universities uh, challenging this. So um, there's a very good chance. Uh, I think all four uh, cases will result in an injunction, uh, and then it's just a matter of time to get the you know wage levels back. Now, you know there there are alternative ways of of getting your LCA certified with a, a wage that's not outlandish. You know, you can use uh, alternative wage surveys and other resources to help, you know, get the prevailing wage set. Obviously, the easiest, most efficient way of doing this is using the uh, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, to use that because all the information, the subsequent information on where the resources came from, how the survey was done, how they got that information is all within the, the government. So there's no additional follow up on, on the wage survey, like, you know, how, who was surveyed, when was it done? There's a lot of other steps that go that are involved if you use like a alternative wage survey. If uh, you know some query does come up. OK, Lucas, as we know, the USCS bring a couple of rules. One is a uh, increase the high wages. The second mm -hmm. one is third party placement approval notice. Maybe they are uh, cut down to the one year less, maybe one year of approval. So let's say uh, on wages already the couple of agencies already started to filing case against the new wages already used told that uh, what about the limited uh, ex, uh, approval notice is That's, anyone is anyone that, filing case anyone do you do you have any information on that one that's already been suspended that was part of the new rule uh including with the forms so with the fee increase and the new forms that was suspended so 
luckily we're not looking at that right now. That would have been implemented if it wasn't, if it didn't have an injunction in December. So hopefully, you know, um, I, I think we're going to have an election before that comes up. And then hopefully we have good results from that election. And by the time the litigation gets to the point of revisiting this, hopefully the agency will rescind that policy and we can go back to somewhat of a normal uh, process for H-1Bs. Because I know it's been very uh, traumatic for the past four years, um, you know, with uncertainty, with with what requirements are, are supposed to be um, uh, updated on a continual basis. Um, and, and, you know, uncertainty about like, you know, if my kids are here, if I have a house, my wife, age four EAD. So hopefully a lot of this goes away and we get back to a normal place here soon. I do want to mention real quick, uh, segue into another topic. I, I today at about, uh, five 30, I received notice from USCIS where they're proposing a new rule for uh, H-1B lottery. So, is good news or bad news? Uh, more bad news. So what they're okay. saying, in the past, if if the requested uh, number of uh, visas isn't initially met, you know, uh, you can just file at any time for H-1B, much like it was 10 or 15 years ago. There's, you know, there wasn't a lottery until later on in the year or whatever. So since, you know, I think 2013, every year we've had lottery because of such high demand for H-1B. Uh, last year, we changed to a uh, registration process first, and then we went to, uh, after you're selected, then you can file your H-1B uh, with USCIS during a, you know, a certain designated time frame. you know, so, and then from there, if all the cases weren't used and there's extra H-1s available, They'll rerun it again and we'll get subsequent uh, approvals to where we have permission to go ahead and file the uh, H1s, uh, you know, for the second batch. And then it'll keep repeating so on and so forth until there's no more visas uh, remaining for that uh, until the next fiscal year. So this year, what they've said, if the, fi if the if it finalizes proposed, USCIS would first select registrations or petitions if the registration process is suspended generally based on the highest occupational employment statistics prevailing wage level that the offered wage level equals or exceeds for the relevant standard occupational classification code and the areas of attended employment. So what they're saying is, uh, you know, you have a higher chance of getting selected if you're wage level four. Uh, and that's just out of the question now, since they went ahead and revamped these wage levels, you know, as a uh, some an F1 student OPT trying to transition to to H1B. There's I don't it'd be very difficult to find an employer who's going to pay you 150 160k a year uh, to qualify. So I think also you know again this is part of the process where a, a proposed rule is uh, first submitted. People have the opportunity to comment um, on that rule before it's uh, you know finalized. Uh, so hopefully, again, the timing of everything, we're already almost in November. Next Tuesday is going to be the uh, general election for the president. And then, you know, thereafter, this rule would at the earliest, it would take effect in early next year. So hopefully um, at that time, if, if there is a change in the government uh, with the president, maybe Congress, uh, you know, we would probably not see this rule implemented. Okay. Is a public uh, review is a 120 days or 180 days? It's uh, right now this this is a 30 day. Uh, so it's kind of a fast tracked one. Uh, we have a 30 day uh, comment period and a 60 day uh, uh, for the information collection before it becomes a final rule. So, I mean, you know, again, early next year is when they're anticipating, but, you know, a lot can be said too. Um, I just think there's a lot of issues that are currently in, um, in in motion right now in the sense that we have a piecemealed effort of changing certain things. And maybe piece one, two, and three are no longer valid because of a court case, but maybe piece four they've implemented like the change in prevailing wages. So there, there's a lot of moving pieces to this that I, you know, I think we haven't rectified at the moment so it's kind of hard to 
see how all the pieces might fit together, so to speak, until we get final resolution on these topics. Okay. I think uh, this one is uh, will impact more of uh, the student, OPT students, I think. Correct. Okay. So, Lucas, uh, uh, in October 6, uh, the USCS has released uh, the new wages. Is already started, right? When, if anyone wants to apply the LCA, we need to consider the new wages, right? Correct. So, well, that's only one method. So, there, there's three different methods we have really to choose uh, what a prevailing wage might be when we're filing the labor condition application. Uh, one of which uh, is going to be using Bureau of Labor Statistics, the OES wage data, uh, which is 99% of what all uh, attorneys use for the, uh, you know, uh, so computer. If, let, let's say, Lucas, if I want to take a new LCA, uh, it means um, the Dallas area, uh, county, maybe Dallas area, it, it mm -hmm. fall into the 122,000 or something for level two. The right. earlier it was uh, 86, 84 or 86,000. So it means when I right. 94k. Okay, sorry. So if I want to take new LCA from Dallas, uh, it should it uh, it file with the 120 122 right now. If if you use the OES wage data from Bureau of Labor Statistics, okay, there there's alternative uh, wage surveys that you can use. There's other resources attorneys can use. Uh, you know, traditionally those are done for people. Uh, in professions like in the medical profession or things like that, usually with uh, in the software developer uh, analyst applications, we, we traditionally rely upon um, the OES uh, wage data, uh, which is published, and that's what changed here recently. So uh, it's it's nothing really new uh, that you that you can use as far as like an alternative to this. It's just typically in this. Uh, for these careers, for, for software developers and analysts and things like that, we typically just rely on the OES wage, uh, wages posted because the difference, the old wages wasn't that great. Uh, so it's just easier to, to use the, that data. But now, I mean, you know, there's other resources we could use. So it's not like you have to uh, be all or nothing as far as 120K. Okay. Is it a private agency? How it is? Um... Yeah, so they're private private surveys. So you can get, you know, from nonprofits or from other, uh, you know, HR, you know, um, um, I guess agencies or things like this. They they have different surveys that they publish. So you know, you can subscribe and you know review that. But uh, there's certain requirements that you have to meet before you can just rely and use a survey. So. Um, you know, pretty much attorney or the uh, uh, petitioner would have uh, a subscription to, you know, uh, utilize that information. Okay. Lucas, I have a question on LCA. I want to uh, uh, send the question. Uh, what if a new LCA is filled with the listing the new address and matching the salary as per the new prevailing wages, but the rest of the stuff like roles and roles and job description in intact in this case does it trigger an amendment ask me again so the lca file is already <clears> there <throat> and you're why are we changing the the why are we filing an LCA? I, th I think um, he changing the address uh, I, let me give the brief information about the lca he got recently uh, extended h1b mm -hmm. x1 got extended 12 uh, 2023 Currently, he is uh, residing one of the apartment. The ones mm -hmm. after approved the LC, uh, H1, he he want to move the another apartments. So unfortunately, his work location is a is a home address. Mm -hmm. So if he want to move to the other apartment, so in this case, he want to file the new LC, right? Because uh, is there is a material change, material material change for work location. So uh, real quick to answer this, depending on how the attorney handled this. So typically, like when I file uh, LCAs for people uh, who are working remotely, we always list, you can list multiple work locations. We always list the home address, maybe if that's a primary, and then the actual incline address. Uh, and then that way that allows an itinerary to be used 
to where you can say, you know, work will be done at this location, if not here. Now, uh, what you can do in this situation is for a short term, and this is just generalized information. I don't know all the facts, so I'm just giving you different rules that might apply to this. Uh, you know, if you have short term uh, placement to another location, uh, let's say for six weeks or four weeks, uh, then that might be fee that that's permissible to work there uh, without having to file an amendment. Now, if you work at a different at a new location for you know ten months, that that would obviously require the uh, an amendment to be filed. Uh, now, the amendment doesn't have to be filed with USCIS, but you do have to pull the LCA with the new work location, and that would have the higher wage level. So. If you're in a scenario like that, it's best to talk to your employer and also the uh, attorney who might represent the employer. And, you know, hopefully if you are moving and let's say you're moving out at the end of this month um, and there's a, you know, a grace period of, you know, let's say a couple of weeks that, until everything gets back to normal, you could probably uh, just you rely on the short term uh, change of work location, at, you know, if that were to come up. But uh, hopefully that answered the question. I, without going, without knowing more details as far as like all the work locations listed and everything else, would be hard for me to say. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So Lucas, uh, uh, I come back on this October visa process. Mm -hmm. Almost uh, we are at the end of this October month. So in this October visa bulletin, most of the applicants are downgrading from EB2 to EB3. We have already been discussing uh, from the last month. Still, we do have a little bit confusion about the I-140 while downgrade to EB2 to EB3. I'm here, uh, two things in I while applying to the I-140. One is the amendment. The second one is the new file for the downgrade process. Let's say when we do consider for the amendment, and when we do consider for the new file, new, you know, applying for the new new I-140 in downgrade process. OK, so we're kind of confused again on the terminology. I, th I think it's easiest to remember, like when people refer to amendment, that's what I would refer to as a downgrade. Um, and when you're filing a fresh case, you're filing a fresh filing. So it's independent of whatever is already there. So you're just filing for a new visa category. So if you're filing for a downgrade, what you know, typically what's going to happen is uh, irregardless of what you're filing, you have to have a certified labor uh, ETA form present. Now you're able, as part of a new field memo from 2007, you're able to reuse a labor certification if it was filed in support of an I-140. Now the I-140 doesn't have to be approved. It could be denied or you know, approved and withdrawn or something like that, but it can't just be unused. If it's unused, it expires, you can't use it. But if it was filed in support of another I-140, you can use that. Now, the caveat with this would be, uh, the safe bet would be to file what we, you know, is a downgrade or to amend is what the terminology is, you know, people are using, but it's really better to say downgrade uh, in the sense that what happens is when you file the, the new I-140, along with the concurrent filing of the adjustment and every, everything else, USCIS literally goes and will get the file or request a copy from DOL of the certified labor, uh, the ETA. So, you know, they're actually going to take it and put it with the new petition. So it's going to be there and support it. Um, I know there's been some people saying, you know, if you downgrade, we don't have uh, original signatures or anything like that. You know, you can, you know, that I don't know how true that those fears are. I know a lot of people are referencing statements from AILA, which have nothing to do with that. And, uh, but, uh, you know, you, you don't have to resubmit, you cannot resubmit the original uh, ETA because the ETA is already, the original ETA has already been submitted, right? So you can request on the I 140 to not downgrade, but just reuse that previously used ETA in support of a new petition, right? So typically what we do is we'll, you know, for reference, we'll include a, a copy of that ETA, but on its, on its own, you can't just file a copy or 
download a fresh copy and sign it or have a scan copy or anything like this and just send in. It has to be, you know, uh, a previously filed ETA. And the, those, if most people remember, they come on the blue paper and you're signed by the certifying officer, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, Lucas, uh, the confusion is uh, if we are downgrading the I-140, uh, maybe I hear, I, I hear, <clears throat> I hear we can apply the two two steps. One is a downgrade, maybe amendment. One is a new file. So if we go for the amendment, the existing EB2 will not use in future. If anything happened in uh, um, anything happened in uh, the current downgrade process, if you apply the uh, new I140. It means I hear. It means we can use the both uh, the downgrade I140 as well and uh, the previous EB2 I140. Is it correct or is any? Uh, can you clarify more on this one? Yeah. So I mean, what you're saying is true as far as a downgrade and a, a duplicate, you know, an additional filing where you have two I140s. Okay. So you have to go back to the beginning. What is the strategy for this? If people want to hold on. Uh, to this EB2, you know, because they believe that eventually the final action dates are going to become current faster than the EB3 final action dates. Now, once you file, let's say your priority date's 2013 August and you downgrade to EB3, well, EB2 2013 August priority date's still uh, four years away, okay? So you're, I mean, and, and how many people or in that four year gap. So that could still be more than four, four actual years. It could probably be 10 actual years. Uh, so, you know, what is the goal of what we're trying to do? So instead of being concerned about what happens to EB2 or things like this, people should be focused on the fact that, hey, I wanna put my hat in the ring, my foot in the door, so to speak. I wanna make sure I have a placeholder. That way, if a law changes or something happens or Congress issues more visas to get rid of this backlog, I'm already there. And it doesn't matter if I'm EB2 or EB3. That's the strategy to be used. We shouldn't focus so much on uh, what transpires between EB2 and EB3 because no matter what happens, we have a broken system at the moment uh, with immigration. We have thousands and thousands of people who are stuck in a backlog, okay? There's no certainty. There's no uh, uh, planning that you can do for a future. And unfortunately, there's people who might spend their whole career in H-1B before they have the opportunity to even have GC in hand. OK, so th this has to come to a, an end at some point. You know, some some fresh people now that are filing and have a priority date in 2020, you know, we're, we're talking like 60 or 90 years under the current system before they can even get a visa. Uh, I just think you, you have to look at everything as a big picture, not focus so much on, um, you know, what's the difference between a downgrade versus a fresh petition. You know, the safe bet's always going to be going to downgrade and get your foot in the door and, and, and rely on that. Not so much to worry about what happens. You know, if you're downgrading from EB2 to EB3, the uh, labor that you used has already obviously been supported and approved to support a, a EB2 petition. So it's you can upgrade at that point, okay? The only difficulty that comes in that scenario is if you're EB3 and the dates move quickly and you wanna move to EB2, well, it takes a little bit of extra analysis and work to make sure that your labor that you have would qualify for EB2 filing. Um, but having said all that, I mean, I think the, the main goal is for, for attorneys, for us, we want to file as many as we can because that would help get as many people uh, with receipts or pending applications in case any law changes, if there's a fundamental change where Congress next year might say, let's get rid of this backlog and they could issue 1 million visas uh, to do so. You know, And if that's the case, it doesn't matter if you're EB1, 2, or 3 at that point. Okay. Lucas, uh, one of the um, the next question on this I-140, the currently EB-3 is ended December 31st, 2014. So the 2015 and 2016 H I-140 holders 
want to apply, maybe want to downgrade to EB2 to EB3, is it, uh, can you give us some suggestion to them? Is it so, good or bad or what is the consequences if they want to downgrade? Just like what we just kind of explained, I would recommend that you wait and see what the trends might be, okay? Obviously, we can't file tomorrow or next week. I don't I don't foresee us being able to, you know, include 2016 priority dates. So the most important thing is to be ready. Uh, being ready means, are you with the same employer who filed I-140? Uh, if so, you know, go ahead and have that conversation with them. Are you going to support me if we if the dates do become current? Number one. Number two, if you're with a different employer, instead of having to, to the, the panic of having to go back to your employer with the previously approved I-140 to see if they'll still support you, go ahead and see if you can start a fresh uh, you know, I-140 so you can pour it over that priority date with your current employer, uh, and then you can plan accordingly at that point of what to do. Um, that's the best you know, advice I can give you, is just be prepared. Um, we, we truly don't know what might happen in the next six months to one year. Yeah, for this moment, everyone is thinking about, uh, even you said that um, U.S. immigration system is a broken, currently is a broken system. So everyone is thinking, uh, right term got an opportunity to the till 2014. In future, maybe EB, EB3 move forward, maybe 2016 or 17. Uh, they are thinking by the time if they are ready in EB3 so that he can, they can apply in regular process. You, you understand, right? In regular process. That's why they are yes. thinking and uh, maybe they are uh, contacting the employers and uh, getting and trying to get the more information. Just I wanted to clarify about that one. So, I mean, yeah. I, I, would, I would just recommend, I mean, I, anyone who wants to obviously hire an attorney to, to do this, I don't think attorney is going to tell them no because... You know, it's more work for us to do, but uh, in, in all practicality, I, I would just recommend, you know, especially if you're sitting around priority date of 15 or 16, uh, have that conversation with your employer, see what's going to happen. If you've already changed employers and you're with a different employer, see if they'll, you know, port over your I-140 and start that labor process uh, so you have that in hand. Uh, you know, it's always best to know all these circumstances ahead of time. Uh, you know, because there's been headache this month for us because there's been people we've been, you know, working with to, that the employer was dragging their feet. We didn't know uh, for sure if they were going to support or not. And it's at the last moment, you know, they'll go ahead and, and process it. So it, it's best if you have the plan in place before anything happens, you know, always plan for the best. Uh, that, you know, the best scenario. And, and then that way, when it when it's there, you're prepared. Okay. So, Lucas, I have a question on uh, I-140. So, I checked the form, but I don't see any uh, uh, clause that is saying that you are applying in EB-2 and uh, applying in EB-3 or maybe downgrading from EB-2 to EB-3. How we, as an applicant, how we can know my application is processing under EB-2 or EB-3 or downgrading EB-2 to EB-3? That's a good question. So uh, on the front page of the I-140, we have to select what category we're going to file. And I'll say, you know, uh, maybe six or seven different categories. So it'll say typically for EB-2 is an advanced degree, not seeking a natural in national interest waiver. That's going to be, I think, 1D. So if we go to 1E or 1F, that's typically going to be used for EB3. So that's just a bachelor's degree required or a special skilled worker. Okay, those are both qualify under EB3. So if you see, I think it's 1E uh, e and F, I think, on the form. If you see that, then you would know it's EB3. Okay, it means most of the applicant is confused because uh, it not given properly. Maybe attorneys understand the process. What is the EB2 and EB3? But as the applicant, a little bit confuse their application process. Well, I think it also goes back in hand in hand. Like the way I work with all my clients, you know, we're 
we have to have a team mindset, a team mentality. We have to all work together. And uh, part of that has to be trust. You know, I have to trust uh, the clients that I have. And, you know, it's part of the process. It's it's teamwork. So, um, you know, a two minute conversation with with someone is easy to fix that issue. And I know it's confusing and there's a lot of things that are that might not make sense. And, and <laughs> you know, if it were easy, you know, it, you wouldn't need an attorney to help with the process. So um, every attorney that that's working with the client, you know, should be able to take a few minutes and help explain, um, you know, because I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of things that were required that are a little different now than in the past uh, this year, including this 944 form. And um, there, once you mail your application, you, you're, you can't control anything. There's nothing you can do. You're going to have doubt creep in your mind. You might have uh, worries. And as part of a, my job as an attorney is to give you peace of mind to, to know that we did the best we could, you did the best you could, and everything's complete and, and uh, you know, touch wood, hope for the best and, and let it be processing. The worst thing you can do is to not have any communication, have attorney just file everything for you. And then you, you have doubts in your mind and, you know, that's going to lead to sleepless nights and, and, and other headaches that, that aren't even necessary because uh, once it's filed, you know, 99% of the time, there's no issue. Okay. okay yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lucas, uh, as we apply this October uh, downgrade process, most of the applicants are downgrading to EV2 to EV3 and also filing and concurrent process. Mm -hmm. We are we are filing the I-140, 485, 765, 131, and 944. 944 is a uh, document. So let's say which uh, application will process first? Is any sequence order or it will it will my question is uh, will I get the EAD even depending on I-140? Will I get the advanced payroll even I-140 pending? So Correct. how the how the process will start? So we kind of touched on this a minute ago. When we, when we file all the forms, they're gonna go uh, and be delivered to the service center. There's two different service centers potentially that uh the forms will go to majority of everyone who's filing i-140 concurrently uh is going to go to uh the texas service center here okay so some people have a uh, supplement j's uh where they're going to file now the supplement j with the adjustment so if you file concurrently with i-140 uh first uscis is going to look to make sure that the package is complete which means all forms are complete all forms are signed checks are there uh, photographs are there, um, supporting evidence, things like that are there. Uh, the forms are going to be processed and scanned, uh, and, and everything's going to be, you know, put together, and then it's going to be forwarded to the actual service center for uh, adjudication. Once it gets to that stage, you're going to actually get a receipt notice for all the, you're going to get four or five different receipt notices in the mail, okay, uh, for each applicant. So you have a family of three, you might get uh, one, two, three, four, about eight, uh, wait, no, six, six uh, receipts for, for that, right? Seven if you filed an I-140 as well. So that process is gonna take about six to eight weeks. So it's not as fast as like a H-1B or anything like that where we might get, especially with premium processing, we should get the receipt the next day or something like that, or a regular process that usually takes about a week to 10 days. This is gonna take a month, month and a half. So people um, are going to be panicking and worried about, oh, my goodness, did my package get accepted? What's going on? Uh, you know, and we just need to understand and all know that this process is going to take a little bit longer. It's a little different than what you might be used to with H1 filing. So uh, receipts, you know, are going to be, you know, between um, you know, four to eight weeks, six to eight weeks, something like that before you receive in hand. Uh, once that happens, Moving on to the next part of the question that you asked, um, the I-765 or the for the EAD and the I-131 advanced parole are going to go ahead and be adjudicated, uh, along with if you filed I-140, they're going to adjudicate that. Now they all kind of go, each application at that point would more or less kind of go its own separate uh, way as far as adjudication, as far as being independent. So I-45 is going to be for your adjustment of status. 
that's going to be uh, processed independently of your 765 and I-131. Uh, and your I-45 is not going to be actually processed until the final action date becomes current. So it's going to, you know, lie in a dormant state for however long that might be. Um, your EAD and advanced parole are going to start, continue being processed. Uh, they're going to be valid for one year at the, you know, the next year, whenever you need to renew, all you have to do is take a copy of the uh, uh, adjustment receipt. You send that back in. Now, the I-140, uh, typically without premium processing, is going to be about seven to nine months. Uh, you know, it, in, the, in between that, there could be RFP uh, or not. Uh, so after you get the receipt for I-140, um, if you want to, you could always upgrade to premium processing and, uh, you know, have it approved within two weeks. Uh, the, you know, that's all, uh, it's not necessary, but it's, it's an option that would be there at that point in time. Okay. The Lucas you said is even uh, I-140 is uh, pending and we can get the EAD and advanced payroll. Let's say if any H1 holder want to use the EAD and advanced payroll, even I-140 pending, can they use the advanced payroll or EAD? They can, but it's very important at that point, you should always maintain non-immigrant status because you know, what happens uh, if you're waiting for the nine months and then your I-140s, something happens and it's denied. Well, the 485 is also going to be denied. And any and then once that happens, your EAD and I, uh, advanced parole are going to be canceled and you won't be able to renew beyond that point. So you're going to have to have a fallback provision at that point. Now, um, you know, it, everyone has their own specific scenarios of what works best for them, but I always recommend it, it. You know, the best course of action is always maintain the non-immigrant status until uh, you have the, the GC in hand. That's the best practice. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that is the same. It means uh, once we get the 485 EAD and uh, advanced payroll, already you you explained to maintain the the non-immigrant status. So if if anyone want to use the EAD and advanced payroll, what is the consequences? Maybe before that one, what kind of, uh, in, in, which, which, in which situation the 485 might be denied? Did you see any uh, cases in your experience? Well, it does come up time to time. So let's say for a common example, this might be um, employer A uh, filed for your I-140 in 2011, let's say, okay, uh, your EB-2 and everything's pending and you still have to wait four or five years. Let's just say under the current system, you're waiting four or five years for the GC. Well, you still have to go to interview. At the interview, they're, you know, they're going to ask questions and review the record. Where have you worked? You know, what have you been doing? Who do you report to? Similar to, you know, what might come up in an H-1B if you have one of these uh, administrative site visits or emails, you know, that they do now. They're wanting to know this information. So what if that information doesn't match with the employer? What if the employer that you had, something happens where they had fraud or misrepresentation? Well, at that point, I mean, even if you're harmless, there's still, your, your 45 is still going to be denied for, um, you know, fraud or misrepresentation. Okay. Let's say, Lucas, uh, uh, if any uh, H1 holder got the EAD and payroll, temporarily you want to use this advanced payroll and uh, EAD for the next couple of years, the after two years he want to come back on H1. What is the process to get on non-immigrant status? Well, you'd have to change your, I mean, you typically, the EAD is not giving you any status so much so so here's here's the issue this is part of the reason why i say our immigration system is broken typically when this process started you're able to file all at the same time so you can go ahead and get your work authorization and then within you know six to nine months you're going to have your gc in hand there's no intention to ever renew there's no need to renew in the past so then uh, we get higher demand so then what happens well it's going to take more than one year to process your gc so now while it's pending, you can work on your EAD and then 
you might have to renew it one time. Well, now uh, the backlog is such that, I mean, we're talking years. So what can happen in, the, in all these years of waiting? It's best to always have, you know, so I, I know people who have uh, worked just on the EAD, okay? Um, and that's just fine, it, you know, as long as everything goes well. Uh, if, if for whatever reason it's denied, your I-145 is denied, you, you know, you'll have 30 some odd days to depart the United States because you're not going to be in status, right? Yeah, and within the 30 days period, the applicant is a chance to apply the H-1 if anyone offer the job? Uh, probably uh, probably not. It might, I mean, it, it, each scenario would have to be looked at independently to see who, who might be able to benefit from that and not. I mean, if that happened, I mean, is the I-140 also denied? If so, then does that mean that you're no longer cap exempt past six years, right? So there's a lot of things that go into this. So a lot of people, you know, at this stage have are already using their I-140 to extend beyond the six years. If something were to happen and, and that I-140 is no longer valid, how can you, I mean, there's no way to even extend beyond six years, right? Okay, it's an interesting question, interesting uh, information. Let's say the 485 got denied. It means the uh, underlying I-140 got automatically denied or? Well, that would be why it would be denied. Correct. So typically if they're in, in, we're getting into very specific details here. So if the underlying petition was uh, misrepresentation of fact or uh, fraud or anything like that, typically the underlying petition is going to be denied. When that's denied, um, 45 is also going to be denied. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Typically th those usually go hand in hand. Okay. Let's say is uh, uh, the employer is uh, everything is good. It it file is uh, uh, he don't have any fraud fraudulent uh, information. The applicant had some maybe some criminal history or something he did not mention in uh, in application process. And 485 at the final processing, he got it triggered all criminal history and uh, got denied. In this scenario, it will not deny the 485, right? No, is it will deny the 485, but not I-140. Is it uh, true or it? So I don't want to answer specifics because there's always uh, things where we can maneuver. Um, I've had it before for people haven't disclosed a DUI or an arrest or something like this. Uh, and we've just been able to update the, the application. Now, it's, I recommend, you know, no matter who says your record's expunged or anything else, USIS is going to know uh, if there's any issue with the law. So it's always best to disclose. They're not going to say you're inadmissible based upon, uh, you know, a DUI. That's not one of the grounds of inadmissibility, okay? If you're communist, a socialist, if you are a member of a totalitarian regime, if you did military training, human trafficking, drug trafficking, you know, there's, you saw all the check boxes and no's, okay? Those are all there because that's what uh, typically makes you inadmissible. Or if you have some uh, certain health related grounds, you know, that you could be inadmissible at that point. Um, so typically, and, and we specialize in this a lot, this is a lot of what we do when we go to immigration court. Um, there's a lot of uh, specific details that go, if you break a certain state law, how does that affect the federal regulations such as uh, immigration law and things like that? Uh, does it meet the same standards? So there, there's a whole other field of juris jurisprudence that goes into that direction that we also handle um, and we navigate. So just having an arrest or something like that is not necessarily going to you know, exclude you from adjusting your status. It just depends on what it might be. Okay. So, Lucas, I have uh, one more scenario on the same I-140 and 485. Let's say one H-1B holder uh, applied the I-140 in company A, mm -hmm. got approved. Later, a couple of years, he moved to the another company. So, he applied another I-140 with that co company B. But mm -hmm. company B, uh, maybe he got the uh, dates are final. He applied the 485. So which application will take is a company B or company A? In for regards, 485. 
for for DeFi apl application. So what you're the scenario you're saying is like company A files I one forty, and then I downgrade or whatever, and I file the adjustment, right? No, no, is that uh, this scenario is a, a little bit different. This is the just I strike that one. So the one H one B holder. First, he joined in company A. He got the I-140. And after two years, he moved to the another company, company B. The company B also applied the I-140. He got the another I-140. It means he had the two I-140. Technically, is a two I-140s, right? Correct. Uh -huh. So, the uh, his green card got, uh, his, his priority date got, uh, the uh, got, Act file, filing action or maybe final action date. It got the priority date for final action date. So he applied the 485. It, in 485 process, company B got, it means company B is misrepresented to him. So 485 is got denied. So in this scenario, is there any chance to apply with the company B if I come back and apply uh, company A. Yeah, it's, it's, the company. It's, it's possible. You probably have to start a whole fresh application at that point. Um, just because the original I-140 would have to be used, you wouldn't be able to supplement like through a supplement J uh, change in employers because the underlying I-140 would no longer be valid. So I want everyone to also remember this. This past uh, two or three years, there's been a large uh, I guess a focus from USCIS on uh, with online security investigations and ICE about people who've used uh, faint client letters or you know things like this. So even if it didn't affect you or impact you, if if the company you work for has an issue where there's they've gone to jail, like the owners of the company have literally pled guilty and gone to jail, uh, you know you're. I, underlying I-140 is probably not going to be valid. So in that scenario, you could go back to empl the employer one and you'd have to start fresh with your I-140 and refile because the underlying I-140 that was based on your 45 would no longer be valid because of fraud misrepresentation. Okay. So the Lucas, I think uh, we saw the news recently. I see is um, arrested. F1 students. Do you have any information on that one? Why they arrested the F1 student? Yeah, so unfortunately, ICE has been, you know, focusing on, um, you know, these students. And, you know, I helped with the Farmington University. There's a university before that, you know, uh, a year and a half before that, where there was a fake university. Uh, right now, I mean, typically, as long as you're maintaining your status as a student and your CVS is still active, um, you know, you, everything should be fine. Um, I'd have to know specifically more information about what happened. I haven't, I don't know the details of, of why the students were picked up, but if their CVS is terminated for whatever reason, like they didn't attend class or they were doing some working a job not related to what they're OPT or CPT or whatever it might be is related to, right? you know, that would be a ground for, for them to lose their status. So typically whenever, you know, they lose status, ICE is going to come in and issue an NTA, detain the person and say, you know, um, you know, you violated your non-immigrant status. We're going to put you through removal proceedings. Uh, in the past, it was easy. Uh, I wouldn't say easy. It's just a different process where someone would go through they would be given a bond or, you know, not even arrested and just said, hey, you know, you need to go to immigration court, uh, immigration court, you get an NTA or notice to appear and you'd show up in court on that date with or without an attorney and then, you know, progress that way through the system. Uh, now, what's been alarming is, is there's pretty much a no bond policy. Uh, and so we've had a lot of these uh, Farmington students come through. And so if something like this happens to you or someone you know, it's best to contact a university, uh, I'm sorry, an attorney to to work with because what happens if uh, these students who attend university, um, you know, the first urge is going to say, hey, let's get everyone out of custody because they don't want to be in jail. And I, I completely agree with that. 
But that can lead you to be uh, stuck here in the United States without status, unable to work, and un unable to travel. So when you are released from ICE custody, uh, ICE is going to keep your passport. And when they keep your passport, obviously, that means you can't travel or do anything. So you might be here, you're, you know, right now, obviously, with uh, COVID, we haven't had a court case uh, for a non-detained person uh, since March. OK, so the the doc is just going to keep back getting backlog, backlog, backlog. And, you know, some of these cases uh, for the first appearance are set for 2022 or 2023 here in Dallas. So what are you going to do, <laughs> you know, without being able to work, without a travel uh, ability? What are you going to do for a couple of years? So there's a little bit of strategy involved with that where we can request, you know, voluntary departure under safeguards, help get the person back home without any uh, permanent damage to their immigration record, you know, where hopefully in the future they can just come back uh, without any issue. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Lucas. So now we can take a couple of calls from conference. Um, yeah, if anyone have the question, maybe you can ask, ask the question. Maybe Uday, Uday Agula. Do you have any question? Hey, Vink. Vinkat, hi. This is Sudhir. Yeah, Sudhir, go ahead. Yeah, you can ask Sudhir. Yeah. Hey, 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 Lucas. Uh, thanks for uh, taking the session. Um, Thank you, so Sudhir. Quick question. So, yeah. Um, quick question. So, I am, uh, my priority date is like 2012, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm planning to downgrade to EB3. Um, so, uh, the main question, I mean, it is roaming around the internet. So, uh, do we need to go with like amendment or uh, do we need to go with new application? I would or recommend I one forty downgrade. I would just downgrade in the sense of the what people are referring to as amendment, where you're using the original file that was already approved, and you're basically changing your category. You're downgrading your category. Um, I would recommend that. And, and the reason being is like what we said before, with your priority date being 2011, you know, right now the final action date for EB2 is 2009. So there's thousands and thousands and thousands of visas between the final action date there and your date. Now, as a rule of thumb, it's easy to think, okay, Sudhir has I-140, that's one person. Uh, so that means one to one, but that's not the, the truth. Whenever you're looking at the visas allotted and the visa bulletin and how you can predict and see how things move, you have to remember as a rule of thumb, typically, uh, Sudhir, I, I would imagine you have a, a wife and probably a, a kid, right? So instead of one, that's now three uh, yeah, people. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. See? So that now that's three people. So now you oh, have no, no. three. Actually, uh, my, my kid is yes. USB to okay, so I but, just, that's the problem there. but just yeah. for example, let's say on average there's, you know, uh, a spouse and one kid that's uh, also going to need a visa. Okay, so now instead of one to one, we're looking at one to three. So every one I-140 equals three visas. Okay, so if you can, you know, add that up right. to 20,000 plus pending EB2s, I mean, that, you know, that, that can exponentially grow quickly so the the basic idea is and the strategy is for you to file so you have a placeholder in case there's comprehensive immigration reform that's the most important thing if you already have your adjustment filed and let's say the law changes or anything else they might say uh, to help clear the backlog anyone who has a pending i1 i-45 at this point the visa is automatically available, right? Congress can do that. And at that point, it doesn't matter if you're EB2 or EB3, at least you have your foot in the door, okay? And that that might preclude or, or you know, have people miss out who don't have the adjustment filed in pending. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, Lucas. Um, um, yeah, just, uh, I mean, a uh, follow-up question on that one. So uh -huh. if we go with amendment, um, um, so in future EB2 dates uh, move forward. Can I can I go back? My Correct. EB2 I140 is still there. 
Correct. You could go back. You you would have to upgrade at that point, but you can. It's virtually the same process okay. as the downgrade. Now, the only caveat with that is, like I said it, it, during the show, is like, does the ETA support the EB two category? Well, you already have EB two, so we know it's already supporting it, right? So if you were originally just EB three and you wanted to upgrade, that's where the the issue lies, where mm -hmm. we would have to be careful because we don't know if the the recruitment details, the job posting, like the requirements for the job itself, meet the standard of what would be required for EB2. Lucas, the following question on the no, same. No, my... uh, the yeah. same, and, the... and you said this, if EB2 is moving forward, we have an option to upgrade. While upgrade the EB2, we can utilize the same um, ET. Yes, the that's, that's, that's the whole uh, process. So, you know, we have, there, there, this is the whole process of what people are referring to. We have a, a memo that was published in 2007. In this memo, it's basically saying, if you have from Department of Labor, a certified ETA that was used in support of a filed I-140, whether or not the I-140 was approved or denied, you can still reuse that labor for future filings. So what does this mean? Well, let's say something happens, I file your case and I want 40 gets denied for some reason, okay? But we can then refile even if the labor is expired. Okay, that's one. Two, uh, in this process from 2011, we can reuse that same labor, downgrade or do whatever we wanna do. It, it's, you know, that rule applies across the board, upgrade, downgrade, refiling, whatever it might be. Because we're still talking about the same job, right? The same job that's offered. Does that make sense? I think yes. Yeah, Sudeet, um, is clear your question? Is there, yeah. Do you have um, any? Uh, uh, what, just one thing to clarify. So you, so Lucas, you were saying that uh, if EB2 dates move forward, then I have to uh, port from EB3 to EB2. Uh, for that, I need to apply I-140 again. So Correct. I cannot use my old I-140 with EB2? Correct. In the sense, in that scenario, in the sense you've, you've taken that one approved one and you've modified it to a different category. Now, that's the safest procedure right that's the best way in my opinion of doing this because you're you already have an approved i-140 and you're requesting just a change in the visa category okay but you know that that's what i would do and and, and like i said don't uh keep this mindset that you have to have eb2 because tomorrow the dates are going to be there right right now you know if we just let everything play out the way it's set at the moment, you're, you're years away before EB2 final action date even <laughs> gets close to your priority date. So um, I've had clients in the, from 2009, you know, uh, let's say uh, June 2009, that we're waiting for two years just from the April 2009, May 2009. I mean, it's just, it takes that long to move these final action dates. So you have a better chance of comprehensive immigration reform where uh, the backlog is addressed and, and all the people with pending I 45s get the visa, you know, automatically, right? Based upon what Congress might issue. Right. Oh. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Lucas. Thank you. Lucas. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Sudhi. So, Lucas, uh, one question on this, now maybe follow up question or let's say. Uh, any H1 H1 applicant uh, applied applied the I140. The form got approved. He about to apply the I140. It means uh, is the right way to apply. Can we apply the four uh, both the I I140 in EB2 and EB3 at one time? Yes. Uh, I mean, you could reuse that labor. So if the labor meets the qualifications to file for EB-2, after EB-2 is um, filed, I mean, you can request a, a copy be used on a subsequent petition, 
you you could do something like that, I guess. Mm-hmm. Okay, it meant because uh, we we had an experience in October visa bulletin. So most of the everyone thinking if I have the two I one four days is a better way to apply in four eighty five. Either I can use the EB two or EB three. Like I said, people should not be so caught up in EB two, EB three. What you should be focused on is if I can file my adjustment. Once your adjustment's filed, focus on that. Once that's there and your foot's in the door, we don't know what tomorrow might bring. Okay. 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 Don't because I, I know so many people they're pain they have these painful deliberations in their mind. Like, should I really wait or should I downgrade? And I can't tell people what to do, but my opinion would be just to go ahead and, and just if you have the opportunity to file go ahead and file There's, the benefits are better than just waiting yeah maybe they are thinking about uh, let's say now the, everyone is downgraded to eb2 eb3 in future maybe eb2 numbers are more forward than eb3 at that time maybe they want to utilize the uh, eb2 eb2 numbers that is the only thing otherwise everything is same in 4d process so and finally they are in line, but uh, they will get someday between. You know what? At this point, I mean, if you already have a, a teenager, I mean, by the time EB two or EB three comes, your teenager might become twenty one years old as as a U.S. citizen, and and then they could, uh, you know, file for you at that point. So it doesn't it wouldn't even matter who's EB two or EB three at that point, right? So, um, you know. It, what we're trying to say is keep all your options open. Obviously, we don't want to lose any, you know, any options. But to be, in my opinion, there, there's nothing in the in the moment that's going to impact you going from EB two EB three. Um, so much, just like in, in Trump's presidency, right? Uh, so much has changed, right? So we, if you were going back four years ago when Obama was president, and you're making plans for, okay, my GC might be available today. You know, four years ago, there was no requirement for an interview for GC. The H-1B uh, rules and regulations were stricter, but not like they are now. Uh, there, there, a lot of things changed that we no one could have predicted where we are today. Even last year, we couldn't predict. Uh, now we're talking about prevailing wages being astronomical. and We're seeing, you know, what are these third-party offsite requirements? What is this employer-employee relationship? You know, no one could have predicted all this it, 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 that's why i say like you should take advantage of today uh, and plan for tomorrow obviously but at the same time don't be so nervous that you miss an opportunity that that's my advice okay yeah thanks lucas so we try to take another call Uday, do you have any question uh, hi, Lost. Uh, I, yes actually, my question answered uh can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Uday. Hello. Oh, okay. Yeah, my uh, filing date is uh, my priority date is uh, August uh, 2011 in EB2. So I was in the fence whether to downgrade or not. I was waiting for the next bulletin to release. Uh, I think uh, hopefully I don't think we'll have anything by tomorrow. So I might go with the downgrade option. You know, it's. It, I, I really feel for people in your position. It's. It's a tough scenario to be in. You know, what. What should I do? Should I wait and see what happens? When you know, and the bulletin's not doing us any favors at this point uh, by taking so long to be published. But you know, it's. It's each person has their own significant circumstances uh, and significance of when to file or why to file. So uh, you know, good luck, and, and hopefully, if you want to file, you you can do so quickly because. You really need to have everything in the mail by tomorrow, and so it arrives on Friday. Yeah, uh, I have all the documents ready, but the only thing is, uh, I was nervous that uh, will there be any negative impact if I'm downgrading from EB2 to EB3 because there are a lot of people doing it, right? So uh, I was worried if USPS uh, can come up with some new rules to restrict. Well, any of these. I, again, what I would suggest is to see like what the opportunity is. If you have your foot in the door, if you're in line, um, and let's say USCIS at November goes back to final action date for filing, December the same thing happens, and then you know, early mid next year we have policy changes, law changes, anyone with pending uh, adjustment application. You know, this has happened in the past. You know, 1999. 
we've had certain, uh, um, uh, I would say grace periods or great things that help uh, move the needle, so to speak, as far as like certain filings for family based petitions. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that can happen and most often for these backlogs when they're addressed is it's focused on what do you have uh, pending as of date X. OK, so I'm just trying to share the information that it's best if you actually have a, an adjustment pending by date. But, you know, if we file it today, then it, whatever happens in the future, you're already set with a, a pending adjustment. And then that way, if the if they say, well, it had to be filed by this date or this date, you're already covered because, you know, it won't retrogress beyond, you know, back before you filed, so to speak, Is that if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Uday. Thanks for call. So, Lucas, yeah, we already passed 12, 12 minutes, seven. So we can um, close this session. Do you have any additional information shared today, this uh, week? Do you have any additional information on um, GC or H1 or any new information, mm -hmm. or if you want to cover anything? I think. Uh... We already touched on some of these uh, new processes and new rules. Uh, I would like to close this week. Uh, we're six days away from the election day, and I know people right now, everyone's working remotely, but if you have any friends that you work with or colleagues that are citizens, um, you know, it might it might benefit everyone if you shared your experience and your story, just so people understand what the impact is on these elections. So if you have a colleague who's a citizen and they know if you personally, if you shared your experience or your story, they would know the, you know, the consequences and, and, and the ramifications we have on this upcoming election to, to participate and vote. So uh, usually my experience, you know, a lot of uh, the jargon and a lot of the talk we hear on the radio or the TV, uh, you know, people kind of get, you know, tuned out with all that. But if there's a name and a face that goes with it and people say, hey, you know, that's not fair. What's going on for this person or that's, you know, to live under this uh, 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 uncertainty is not fair. You know, it, it, sharing a simple story could impact a lot of uh, uh, things that happen in, in the upcoming election. So. If you if everyone's comfortable or if they have good friends or neighbors or colleagues, you know, share your story. It's 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 always important to do that. And, and that way people understand the ramifications that the election might have on you and, and people like you. <laughs>